No. Good morning. <laughs> this is our first session uh, on a survey of church history beginning from the beginning to 1516. And this will be part one. I believe we're going to probably have four sections by the time we complete this. So this will be part one from the beginning to 1516. Um, and so we're going to go ahead and begin this morning. Christianity is the only major religion to have, its, to have as its central event, which we'll use that term uh, from here on, as the humiliation of its God. Crucifixion was a barbaric uh, death. It was reserved for the worst kind of criminals and enemies that, of the Roman Empire. A notice was typically mounted on the cross notifying the public of the victim's name, the crime they committed, and in Jesus' case, that noted declared that uh, he was Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. Pontius Pilate intended this notice to irritate the Jewish leaders. However, like the cross itself, Jesus' followers found special meaning in the message. Believers in the Lord Jesus have sought to serve him by spreading his message to the world. The church has encountered numerous obstacles in her quest to become the spotless, pure bride of Christ. Many of those obstacles resulted in crowning achievements. Others brought disgrace to the church. As we look back through history and examine the actions taken by church leaders as they dealt with the circumstances and issues facing them, we will gain a better understanding uh, and a deeper insight concerning the things addressed by the apostles in their various letters to the churches. We will see that these Holy Spirit-inspired writings are just as relevant to the church today as they were at the time they were written. Our goal is the same as that of the early church. To bring the message of salvation to a lost and dying world and to lead them to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We can learn from the many mistakes made throughout history and move forward in the power of the Holy Spirit as we demonstrate the power of the cross in our lives. Um, going to section one, the beginning. This is entitled The Age of Jesus and the Apostles. And our date here is approximately 6 B.C. to 70 A.D. Uh, Christianity's roots go back to the Jewish history a long time before the birth of Jesus Christ. It was Jesus of Nazareth, however, who attacked the established Judaism and brought a renewal movement into history's light early in the first century. After his crucifixion under the Roman official, Pontius Pilate, Jesus' teachings uh, spread through the Mediterranean area. The Apostle Paul was especially influential. He stressed God's gift of salvation for all men and thus led in Christianity's emergence of Palestinian Judaism to a position as a universal religion. Uh, the Jesus movement was, uh, Jesus was a Jew himself. He studied Jewish law and he observed the Jewish religion. It's been questioned whether Jesus ever intended to create a company of followers called the church. During his earthly ministry, Jesus taught his disciples about life and what he called the kingdom of God. He introduced them to the new covenant that bound them together in forgiveness and love. This simple company lacked many of the laws, rituals, officials, ceremonies, and beliefs of Judaism, and even later Christianity. They were a society apart, living in the world and yet not of it. Jesus persistently taught about the special kind of life that separated the kingdom of God from rival authorities among men. Slowly, uh, Jesus' disciples realized that following Jesus meant saying no to the voices of the world, calling for their loyalties and their attention. This was the truth of the Jesus movement, and in that sense, at least Jesus founded the church. Uh, Palestine, in Jesus' day, <clears throat> consisted of about two million or more people, uh, and they were a mixture of various cultures and people divided by religion, uh, region, politics, and ruled by Rome. In Jesus, in a, in, in a day's journey, a man could travel from rural villages where farmers tilled the build, fields with primitive plows to bustling cities where men enjoyed the comforts of Roman civilization. The holy city of Jerusalem, Jewish priests offered sacrifices to the Lord of Israel. While at Sebast, only 30 miles away, pagan priests held rites in honor of the Roman god Jupiter. Jews, who represented about half of the population, greatly resented both their Roman overlords and the pagan culture that they brought with them. Roman rule brought the Hellenistic, which was the Greek culture, 
that the Syrians had tried to impose on the Jews over a hundred years prior. All Jews despised their overlords, but disagreed about how to resist them. Jewish prophets had prophesied for centuries prior to the birth of Jesus, promising a day when the Lord would deliver his people from their pagan rulers and establish his kingdom upon the earth. <clears throat> he would send a Messiah to bring an end to the corrupt rule on earth. Several Jewish factions arose out of distaste for life under Rome, each interpreting the crisis in a different way. The Jesus movement was uh, one of them. The Pharisees emphasized the Jewish traditions and practices that set them apart from the pagan culture. Their names separated ones, and, their pride, and they prided themselves on their strict observance of every detail of Jewish law. They were intolerant of those they cons considered to be ritually unclean. Their piety and patriotism made them respected leaders among the people. The Sadducees actually found Roman rule to be an advantage. This group consisted of most of Jerusalem's wealthy aristocracy and the families of the high priest as well as the lesser priest of the temple. Many of them enjoyed the sophisticated manners and fashions of Greco-Roman culture and even took Greek names. At the time of Jesus, these men controlled by the Jewish high council or the Sanhedrin, but they had little influence among the general population. The zealots were bent on armed resistance against all Romans in their land. The Galilean hills often concealed guerrilla bands ready to ignite <clears throat> a revolt or destroy some symbol of Roman authority in Palestine. The, es the uh, Essenes, having no interest in po politics or warfare, withdrew into the Judean wilderness and lived in monastic communities. They studied the scriptures and prepared themselves for the Lord's kingdom. It is thought that John the Baptist spent time among this group of people. Jesus called for his followers to continue to, to not confuse the purpose of his mission with that of these others. His ministry began by joining a new movement in the Judean wilderness led by the prophet John the Baptist. To fulfill all righteousness, uh, the scripture says, Jesus submitted to John's baptism and then began to proclaim, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel, Mark 1.15. Uh, initially, traveling along through the villages of Galilee, Jesus would enter the local synagogue and teach the people. It is believed that he was welcomed because the towns had often <clears throat> towns often had no resident rabbi, and they relied on the services of wandering rabbis and teachers like Jesus. Jesus' main theme was the kingdom of God, and the people often wondered what he might mean by that. Uh, did he believe in a dramatic intervention of God in the history of the world, or did he mean that the kingdom is already here in some way? Jesus proclaimed that the rule of God was already present and performed numerous miracles and healing power to prove this point. Jesus' miracles were signs to the people that God was truly among them. He often cautioned those that he healed to be silent in an attempt to prevent his miracles from being misinterpreted and he be seen as simply another magician. Crowds grew wherever he was because of the wonders he accomplished. His popularity arose controversially, uh, controver arose, aroused controversy, especially among the Pharisees who hated to see the people following and listening to a man who had never studied under their scribes. They questioned his credentials openly. His message, <clears throat> Jesus welcomed the challenges of the Pharisees, which gave him opportunity to contrast his message of repentance and grace with the self-righteousness of the Pharisees. Jesus' parable about the praying Pharisee and the tax collector in Luke 18 clearly contrasts the piety of the Pharisees with the attitude of the Jesus movement. Out of hundreds of followers, Jesus called 12 to travel with him full time. For them, he drew a distinction between the kingdom and the kingdom of the kingdom and the kingdom of the world. His followers were to represent another type of society and another type of greatness that was completely foreign to the world. Jesus, uh, leaders in the kingdom of the world lorded over others, but God's kingdom is governed in a completely different way by love and service. Fear not, he told them. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. After Jesus fed 5,000 at the Passover, uh, many... Many tried to proclaim him king. He knew that they had no idea of God's plan and removed himself to the hills with his uh, committed few disciples. The crowds looked at him through the eyes of tradition concerning the messianic redeemer God would send to deliver them. 
They failed to remember Isaiah's portrait of the suffering servant in Isaiah 53 and his humility in Zechariah 9.9. The only time Jesus openly identified himself with the Messiah of Jewish, of Jewish prophecies was on the Sunday before his last Passover when he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey in fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecy. Upon Jesus' final entrance into Jerusalem and his cleansing of the temple, people flocked to see and hear him. Rumors spread quickly about the appearance of the Messiah and the imminent destruction of the temple. Temple authorities were alarmed, believing he would start an uprising which would be crushed by the Romans. So common fears of the Pharisees and Sadducees united them against Jesus, and they concluded that he should be brought to trial and eventually executed. During the Last Supper with his disciples, Jesus took the cup and he declared... 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five. 25, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The background was the exodus from e Egypt and the formation of Israel as a nation. Jeremiah had promised a day when the covenant on tablets of stone would be replaced by a covenant written in the hearts of men. Jesus declared that the new covenant had come. A new people of God enjoying the forgiveness of sins is now possible through the shedding of his own blood. Jesus was betrayed, tried, he was condemned to death in fulfillment of the scriptures. As he uttered his final words on the cross, it is finished. A new chapter began for all mankind. Christianity and Judaism, the old versus the new wineskin. In the eight years after Jesus' death, the Jewish council had little rest. No one knew how to stop the spread of this movement. The council had repeatedly commanded Jesus' followers to stop talking about Jesus, but the disciples only grew bolder even accusing the council of killing the Messiah. Stephen stood before them speaking of Jewish history, but arguing that men could worship God apart from the temple. He proclaimed that Jesus was the promised Messiah. The mob scene, trial and death of Stephen, which was the, who was the first Christian martyr, provides the answers as to how Christianity emerged from, a Jew, from its Jewish roots. How did Jewish, a Jewish Messiah preaching a Jewish theme, the kingdom of God, to a Jewish following become the savior of people everywhere. Stephen's confrontation revealed the fact that it was not a question of what the Jewish scriptures said, but what did they mean. The law began with the Ten Commandments, but went on until some regulation covered every detail, every action, and every thought in life. It prescribed every move in true worship and every step in true piety. Stephen disagreed. He insisted the institutions of Jewish life were temporary, and that God intended them to point beyond themselves to the Messiah who would fulfill all righteousness for, the, for all people. The Old Testament's central purpose was the promise to promise the Messiah, and he had come in person, and that person being Jesus. Uh, <clears throat> before his ascension, Jesus told his disciples at Pentecost to gather in Jerusalem and wait there until they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. 120 disciples were in the upper room on the day of Pentecost when God's Spirit fell. The house was filled with the sound of a violent, rushing wind, and tongue-like flames of fire rested upon every head. The disciples were filled and began to speak in other tongues. Many visitors in the city heard them and understood what they were saying. Peter spoke to the huge crowd that had gathered because, the commotion, because of the commotion and proclaimed that God had made Jesus Lord and Messiah by raising him from the dead. From the beginning... The apostles preached the resurrection of Jesus as a fulfillment of God's purpose announced in the Old Testament. The Messiah, once crucified, was exalted above the universe. Apart from that miracle, there is no gospel, no salvation, and there is no church. Peter told the people to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for your sins. will be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that's recorded in Acts 2.38. About 3,000 joined the Jesus movement that day, and the Christian church had begun. Stephen got Stephen's understanding of that Christianity could never be confined to the rigid boundaries of the Pharisees' law was being seen. When asked by why his disciples did not fast like the Pharisees did, Jesus had said, Men do not pour wine into old wineskins. <clears throat> if they do, the wineskins will burst. The wine will not run out and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour wine into new wineskins and both are preserved. The most important development in the first century was the rip in the old wineskins. Uh, no, no one doubted the first community was Jewish. It included Jesus' mother, Mary, other kinsmen, along with the apostles. Since they were all devoted 
uh, Jews. They remained loyal to their Jewish law and continued to worship in synagogues and the temple for a time. Outwardly, their lifestyle resembled, resembled that of any other Jewish sect for that period in time. The disciples called their movement the way, emphasizing their belief that Jesus would lead his followers to the kingdom of God. Before long, the Jerusalem community came to speak of itself by an Old Testament term used to refer to the assembly of Israel. The Greek equivalent was ecclesia, or church in the English. And it meant a gathering of people, which would be God's people, of course. At first, the Sanhedrin was tolerant, partly because Jesus' followers attended temple services regularly and strictly observed Jewish laws and rituals. They showed no signs of rejecting the law of Moses or the authority of the temple. Within two years, there were several thousand followers living in and around Jerusalem. The apostles led the movement, maintaining its unity by two special ceremonies that kept the reality of Jesus' death and resurrection at the center of their fellowship. The first baptism marked the entrance into a spiritual kingdom. These first Christians believed that the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus followed by the coming of the Spirit at Pentecost were divine events <clears throat> that inaugurated were divine events that inaugurated a new age. People could now enter life in that spiritual kingdom by faith in Jesus as Lord and witness to that faith by baptism. Secondly, the Lord's Supper looked back to Jesus' betrayal and death and found evidence of the new covenant in the event of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus' death and new life in the Spirit were symbolized and sealed in the disciples by their drinking from the cup and eating the consecrated bread. This simple meal renewed their covenant with God and with one another. The Hellenists, uh, the Hellenists were bound together by the teaching of the apostles and the two ceremonies depicting the death and resurrection of their Lord. The infant church spread throughout Judea. Rapid growth aroused fears in the authorities and created tensions in the church. More and more of the new converts were from among the Hellenist Jews. These were Jews who had come to Jerusalem from all parts of the Roman Empire to settle in the holy city. Many had come on pilgrimages and decided to stay. These immigrants, like immigrants today, lived in separate communities. They spoke Greek and they used the Greek version of the Old Testament, which is the Septuagint. Hellenistic Jews were faithful to their religion, but they had long been exposed to Greek culture. Having come from many other places in the world, they mixed more easily with Gentiles and were more responsive to new ideas that the Jews than the Jews of Palestine. Unity in the church was threatened when the Hellenists complained that their widows were being overlooked. The apostles created a council of seven Hellenist disciples called deacons to oversee the distribution of food. Stephen, one of these deacons, preached in Jerusalem's Hellenist synagogues and touched off the riot that led to his death. Groups of vigilantes began to seize and imprison suspected followers of Jesus. Saul of Tarsus was one of the vigilante leaders. The Hebrew apostles were not molested by the, Hebrew, by the Hellenistic Jews, but were forced to flee Jerusalem. They found refuge in Samaria and Syria and established Christian communities in these places. Uh, the Hellenist Christians established churches in Damascus, Antioch, uh, Tarsus in Syria, on the island of Cyprus, and in Egypt. News of the churches among the Hellenists arrived in Jerusalem, and the elders soon sent delegates to establish ties with the new Christian centers. Peter and John went to Samaria to confer with Philip. Barnabas, <coughs> a Jew from Cyprus, traveled to Antioch in Syria, where unnamed men from Cyprus and Cyrene began to evangelize Gentiles. Antioch was the administrative capital of the Roman, Roman providence in Syria. Its racially mixed population was mostly Gentile, but there was also a large Jewish community. At Antioch, Jesus' followers were called Christians for the first time. Antioch grew in Christian influence and exceeded Jerusalem as a center for missionary outreach due in large part to the work of Saul of Tarsus who joined Barnabas there in A.D. 44. Uh, the apostle Paul, who was uh, originally called Saul of Tarsus, met Jesus, the Messiah, on the road to Damascus and he immediately became a believer. Saul had heard Stephen's message and came to the understanding that the law of God was given for a time to convince men of their inability to fulfill the will of God and to leave them with no choice but to accept the good news of Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. Saul was uniquely qualified to bridge the gap between Jewish and Gentile communities. He was a man of three words, Jewish, 
worlds, Jewish, Greek, and Roman. He was educated in the strictest Jewish tradition, having studied under Gamaliel in Jerusalem. He was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews concerning the law, a Pharisee concerning zeal, persecuting the church concerning righteousness, which is in the law. He was blameless, according to Philippians 3, 5 through 6. It's interesting to note that the name Saul means dedicated to God, and he was sincerely dedicated to God. However, sincerely wrong, he may have been in his pursuits. After his conversion, he adopted the name Paul, which means little or small. While remaining dedicated to God, he no longer, he now no longer <clears throat> had pride in his natural roots. He willingly sacrificed everything to serve his master Jesus Christ. Paul spoke Greek fluently and was familiar with Greek thought and literature. He could express the doctrines and the teachings of Jesus, many of which were based on Old Testament beliefs that were completely foreign to Gentiles in ways the pagan mind could not understand. As a Roman citizen, Paul had special freedom of movement, protection in his travels, and access to the higher levels of society. Paul made a series of trips throughout Asia Minor, Minor which is uh, today modern Turkey, and Greece preaching Jesus as the Christ and planting churches of Gentile believers. The majority of his converts were pagans with sword past. Paul reminded the people in one of his letters to the Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 11, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. Continuing, Tensions between the Jewish and Gentile believers in the first century centered upon the question of the best way to instill Christian principles of morality in the Gentile believers. Palestinian Christians were steeped in Judaism, held that the Gentiles should submit to the Jewish law in addition to believing in Jesus. Paul believed this was impossible and believed that there was another way. He held that man could be accepted as righteous only through God's undeserved mercy or grace. And grace always arises from the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul's itinerant ministry won more and more believers to his uh, convictions. His first journey took him to the island of Cyprus and the main cities in the province of Galatia in Central Asia Minor. He visited the congregation he had founded on his second journey and then traveled across Western Asia Minor to Tross, where he decided to carry his mission to Europe. In Macedonia, he set foot on European soil for the first time. From Philippi in northern Macedonia, Paul traveled to Thessalonica and Berea, then visited Athens, the birthplace of Western civilization, and, the, and then Corinth. On his third missionary journey, Paul founded a church at Ephesus where he preached and taught for more than two years. Upon his return to Jerusalem, he was arrested and imprisoned by Jewish officials. He spent two years under house arrest in Caesarea, the Roman capital of Judea, until he finally exercised his right as a Roman citizen and appealed to Caesar. Paul spent his final years in Rome awaiting trial. Allowed to continue his preaching, he probably won many other converts and became influential in the Roman church. He was beheaded during Emperor Nero's persecution of Christians in A.D. 64. By the time Paul's death in Rome, the breach with traditional Judaism was almost complete. Gentile believers were not circumcised. They neither knew nor practiced Jewish dietary laws. And in most areas, the Sabbath, uh, which is Saturday, observance had he given way to worship on the first day of the week, the day which Jesus rose from the dead, which we call Sunday. <clears throat> uh, the decline of Jerusalem represents the climax of the separation of ways. About A.D. 41, James, the son of Zebedee, was executed, and his brother John is thought to have fled Judea. Peter was arrested shortly after James' death, but escaped and began an extensive missionary journey. He visited Antioch, Corinth, and other cities in Asia Minor. He traveled to Rome, where he too was caught up in Nero's persecution and martyr. James, the brother of Jesus, assumed leadership of the church in Jerusalem, but he too was murdered by command of the Jewish high priest. His death left the church leaderless and demoralized. Tensions between the Jews and the Romans increased in A.D. 70. Romans, Roman forces led by Titus broke through the walls of Jerusalem, looted and burned the temple, and carried off the spoils of Rome. 
The holy city was utterly destroyed. Every synagogue in Palestine was burned. At the start of the revolt, the leaders of the Jerusalem church were advised in a vision to flee the city. Pious Jews considered the Christian flight an act of treason and sealed the fate of the church in the Jewish world. Christian Jews were barred from synagogue services. Any Jew who wished to remain faithful to his religion could not also be a Christian. The new faith had become and would remain a Gentile movement. The old wineskin was irreparably torn. Most of the original apostles were dead, and the churches that they had founded passed into new hands. More lasting and resilient than the forces against it, the message of the apostles would endure persecution and opposition, emerging centuries later as the dominant faith of the Roman Empire. In section 2, we talk about the age of Catholic Christianity, and the time period here is from about 70 A.D. to 312. In this particular period, Christianity spread throughout the Roman Empire and probably east to India. Christians realized that they were a part of a rapidly expanding movement. They called it Catholic. This suggested that it was universal. In spite, in spite of, of a regular Roman ridicule. persecution, and it was the true faith in opposition to all perversions of Jesus' teachings. To face the challenges of their times, Christians turned increasingly to their bishops for spiritual leadership. Catholic Christianity, therefore, was marked by a universal vision, by orthodox beliefs, and by the Episcopal Church type of government, which is uh, explained or given to you in a graph here or graphic on the center of this page. Um, <clears throat> to begin with, only worthless people, uh, or so-called considered worthless people, were uh, beginning to be become part of the church. And the spiritual explosion... It, Ignited by the Spirit of Jesus, the church hurtled in all directions, geographic as well as social, during the first century. The second and third centuries provided a channel for this power. Christianity began to lay plans for the long haul, and in the process shaped the character of the Christian faith for generations to come. The period, this period, gave us Catholic Christianity. It was more than an organization. It was a spiritual vision, a conviction that all Christians should be, be in one body. Jesus commissioned his disciples to go into the world. Paul laid down his life, opening the door for the church for the Gentiles. In a sense, Catholic Christianity was simply a development of Jesus' plans and Paul's efforts. While the term Catholic never appears in the New Testament, the universality of Christianity is a common idea, and this thought dominates Christian history between the death of the apostles and the rise of the Christian emperors. Ignatius, bishop of Antioch in the early 2nd century, appears to be the first to use the word. He spoke of the Catholic Church when he said, Wherever Jesus is, there is the Catholic Church. By the end of the 2nd century, the term Catholic was widely used of the church in the sense that the Catholic Church was both universal in contrast to local congregations and orthodox in contrast to the uh, heretical groups. So the spread of the faith in certain times, even before Jesus, many Gentiles, Greeks and Romans, found the teaching of the Jewish synagogue compelling and became God-fearers. The preaching of the gospel found its most fruitful response from this group. The centurion that Jesus met was one of these, as was Cornelius, whom Peter visited. When Christian preachers made it plain that they could receive all that Judaism offered and more without submitting to the rite of circumcision, it was not difficult for them to take one further step and accept Jesus Christ. Most of the God-fearers knew the Old Testament well. They understood its theology and accepted its moral values. Like the Jews and their synagogues, Christians had their local assemblies from the start, they saw themselves as a kind of new Israel, a fellowship of believers throughout the world, which explains why early Christians thought in Catholic terms. The world in the Roman times meant cities. Paul set the pattern for evangelism. <coughs> Excuse me. Paul set the pattern for evangelism by settling for a time in one of the greatest cities of the empire and thrusting out from this center to the smaller towns in the region. After the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70, the center of the Christian movement moved north and eventually to the west. The second home of the church was Antioch of Syria. Under a succession of bishops, the church in this third largest city of the empire took root and exerted widespread influence throughout Syria. By the end of the fourth century, Antioch was a city 
of a half a million people, and a half of them were Christians. Edessa lay beyond the empire's boredom, border, but had close ties with Antioch. It claimed that the founder of the church there had been one of the 70 disciples of Jesus, a man named Adai. Uh, Serpion, bishop of Antioch, consecrated the Edison Christian named Palut to be bishop of the capital city in about 200. It is thought that some unknown Christians from Edessa continued east until they came to India. So-called Thomas Christians in India today believe that the Christian was the Apostle Thomas. A voyage by Thomas to South Sea in the first century was certainly possible. <clears throat> As things moved west, the mainstream of early Christian missionary work moved west of Antioch. Paul had set a course for Italy and Spain, and his work proved to be the path of the future. Moving from uh, Antioch, the next city of note would be Ephesus, a seaport located in Asia Minor of modern Turkey. We also know that the rural remote province of Bithynia in northwest Asia Minor was a center of unusual growth early in the second centuries because of a letter written by the governor of the region to Emperor Trajan expressing concern over the rapid spread of the Christian faith. Further west, the Roman church planted by unknown believers in the first century grew rapidly. It is estimated that by A.D. 250 there were approximately 30,000 Christians living in Rome. Most of these were from the poorer classes. This church, under the leadership of both Peter and Paul, gained respect throughout the empire. Progress of the gospel west and north beyond, beyond Rome appears to have been slow. In the southern area of what is now France, then called Gaul, we know a church existed in Lyons in the middle of the second century because the bishop Irenaeus left many writings. There is no firm idea how Christianity first entered Britain. It may have been through some Roman soldier or a merchant. <clears throat> we do know that three bishops from Britain attended a church council in Arles in the southern France in A.D. 13. In North Africa, moving across the Mediterranean, Carthage dominated the area now known as Tunz uh, Tunisia and Algeria. Almost every town and village in this region had its own bishop and its own tensions. The writers... Martyrs and bishops were no, uh, we know are nearly all from the Romanized section of the community. North African Christians produced the first Latin-speaking churches <clears throat> in the world, which means that they tended to be upper class. Slaves and poor men spoke Greek or one of the native dialects. Problems of race and language led to cultural classes, which meant trouble for the churches during the Great Persecution. The movement spread east, of course, across North Africa to Cyrene, just west of Egypt. This area was mentioned several times in the New Testament. Simon of Cyrene carried the cross of Jesus in Mark 15, 21, and his son, Rufus, is mentioned in the circle of believers in Romans 16, 13. Cyrenians were present on the day of Pentecost when Peter preached to the crowd. Some of them disputed with Stephen in Acts 2, 10, and also chapter 6, verse 9. The Cyrenians also took part in the decision to carry the gospel beyond Israel to the Gentile world. By the 5th century, half a dozen bishops labored in the area. Alexandria, the empire's second largest city, had a large Jewish population led by Philo, well-known philosopher and contemporary of Paul. Philo <clears throat> struggled to, to interpret Judaism in the terms of Greek philosophy. Christians in the city struggled with the same problem, and a famous school was established to concentrate on making the gospel intelligible uh, to people immersed in Greek culture. Early Christians in Alexandria claimed John Mark was the founder of the church, which exerted wide influence throughout this region during the 3rd and 4th centuries. By the end of the 3rd century, no area of the empire was without some testimony to the gospel. The strongest areas were Syria, Asia Minor, Minor North Africa, and Egypt, as well as Rome and Lyons. <clears throat> Village people in most areas remained untouched. The social impact of the gospel, uh, the Catholic vision of early Christians was as evident in the social impact of the gospel as it is as in its geographical expansion. For the first three centuries, the majority of believers were simple, humble people. They were slaves, women, traders, and soldiers. <clears throat> Celsus a critic of Christianity once said, 
Far from us, say the Christians, be any man possessed of any culture or wisdom or judgment. Their arm is to convince only worthless and contemptible people, idiots, slaves, poor women and children. These are the only ones whom they manage to turn into believers. <laughs> uh, it is to the church's credit that they did not neglect the poor and despised. By the end of the second century, the new faith was on its way to becoming the most forceful and compelling movement within the empire. Many people with the keenest minds of the day were becoming believers. Several Christian writers arose to defend the Christian faith against the rumors and the criticisms of the pagans. These apologists, <coughs> which means defense, uh, defended the gospel, answering the accusations of the enemies of Christianity and pointing out the weaknesses of paganism. Aristides... Justin Martyr, his disciple, Tatian, Athenagoras, Theophilus of Antioch, and the unknown author of the letter of Diognetus, Diognetus and Melito, Bishop of Sardis in Asia Minor, all directed their spiritual gifts to this cause. Irenaeus, Bishop of Lyon in Gaul, wrote five books against the Gnostic heresies as well as a book entitled Proof of the Apostolic Preaching. His theology was grounded in the Bible and the church's doctrines and helped provide a steadying, positive influence in the church. Tertullian, the father of Latin theology, was born in Carthage around A.D. 150. Upon his conversion to Christianity, he began writing books to promote Christian faith. His apology underlined the legal and moral absurdity of the persecution directed against Christians. Others of his book offered encouragement of those facing martyrdom. He attacked heretics, explained the Lord's Prayer and the meaning of baptism, and helped develop the orthodox understanding of the Trinity. He was the first person to use the Latin word trinitas, or trinity. He was truly one of the most powerful writers of his time. While Tertullian was at work in Carthage, Alexandria was becoming another key intellectual center for Christianity. Uh, Pantaneus a converted Stoic philosopher began a school and was teaching Christians in AD 185. He probably traveled to India. His pupil Clement carried his work to greater heights at the close of the second century. The school grew more and more important in spite of times of intense persecution, strengthening the faith of Christians and attracting new converts as well. By the third century, the Christian church was becoming an empire within the Roman Empire. Constant travel be became... <clears throat> Uh, constant travel be be between different churches. The, syn the, syn the synods of bishops and the letters carried by messengers back and forth across the empire and the loyalty Christians showed to their leaders and to one another impressed even the empress. Uh, there are several reasons, many reasons, for the gospel spread. Uh, why did the Christian faith spread in this extraordinary way? By ordinary standards, nothing could have been less likely to succeed than Christianity. The devout believers stressed the power of the gospel, insisting that God was at work in the movement and went with those early witnesses. God works through human hearts and hands. People in the second century turned to Christ, as they do today, for a variety of reasons. Early Christians were moved by a burning conviction. They knew that men had been redeemed and that they could not keep, themselves, <clears throat> that they could not keep to themselves the gospel of salvation. That unshakable assurance in the face of every obstacle, including martyrdom, helps explain the growth of the church. The Christian gospel met a widely felt need in the hearts of people. Only the act of love of God could make the Christian life possible and direct the believer outward to the needs of his fellow man. The practical expression of Christian love was probably among the most powerful causes of Christian success. Tertullian tells us the pagans remarked, See how these Christians love one another? Christian love found expression in the care of the poor, of widows and orphans, and in visits to brethren in prisons or those condemned <clears throat> to living death in the mind, a living death in the mines, and in acts of compassion during a famine, earthquake, or war. The fact that the church often provided burial services for poor brethren was an expression of love that had particularly far-reaching effects. Uh, Lactanius, North African scholar, in 240 to 320, wrote, We will not allow the image and creation of God to be thrown out to the wild beast and the birds as they pray. It must be given back to the earth from which it was taken. The church acquired burial grounds, one of the oldest of which is South Rome on the Appian Way, 
at a place named Cata Catacombas. The, this explains how Christians became associated with the catacombs, which were the underground corridors used for cemeteries in and around Rome. Emperor Julian, who lived from, uh, or reigned from 332 to 63, saw the, the drawing power of Christian love and practice. He stated atheism, which when they referred to atheism, they're referring to Christian faith. Uh, because they didn't believe in all the other multiple gods and they didn't participate in emperor worship. So they were called atheists, the Christians. Uh, has, been has, has been specially advanced through the loving service rendered to strangers and through their care for the burial of the dead. It is a scandal that there is not a single Jew who is a beggar and that the godless Galileans care not only for their own poor but for ours as well. While those who belong to us look in vain for the help that we should render them. Persecution helped to publicize the Christian faith. Martyrdoms were often witnessed by thousands in the amphitheater. The term martyr originally meant witness, and that is what many Christians were at the moment of death. For instance after instance, these individuals exhibited cool courage in the face of torment, courtesy toward enemies, and joyful acceptance of suffering as the way appointed by the Lord to lead to his heavenly kingdom. A number of pagans were converted at the very moment of witnessing the condemnation and the death of Christians. Christian churches multiplied until Rome could neither ignore nor suppress the faith. It had to come to terms with it. This period moved Christianity from the catacombs to the imperial courts and serves to remind us that the church is truly Catholic only when it is impelled by the gospel to bring all men to a living faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? So... Um, <clears throat> The early church was a noble army of martyrs. However, prior to A.D. 200, Roman attempts to silence Christians were generally half-hearted because, because few Roman emperors were truly bloodthirsty villains. Polycarp, the aged bishop of Smyrna in western Asia Minor, was brought into a crowded arena and fed to the lions. The governor pleaded with him, simply swear by Caesar because they only wanted a denial of the charges against him. However, Polycarp stated, I am a Christian. If you want to know what that is, set a day and listen. Persuade the people, answered the governor. Polycarp said, I would explain to you, but not to them. Then I'll throw you to the beast. Bring on your beast, said Polycarp. If you scorn the beast, I'll have to be buried. If you scorn the beast, then I'll throw you to the beast. Bring on your beast, said Polycarp. If you scorn the beast, I'll have you burned. You try to frighten me with the fire that burns for an hour, and you get the fire of hell that never goes out. The governor, the governor called to the people. Polycarp says he is a Christian. The mob shouted, This is the teacher of Asia, the father of the Christians, the destroyer of our gods. So Polycarp, praying that his death would be an acceptable sacrifice, was burned at the stake. <clears throat> Roman authorities were tolerant of religions from those lands conquered by their regions. If the national region, religion excuse me, would add homage to the emperor and the other ceremonies, to their other ceremonies, Rome almost never interfered. In one instance, Rome dropped the requirement of burning incense to the emperor. The Jews, with their fanatical loyalty to their one true God and their readiness to die before acknowledging any other deity, were the exception. As long as Roman authorities considered Christians as one of the more sect of Jews, believers enjoyed the same immunity from imperial pressure. However, the Jews made it known that they would have nothing to do with Christianity. And so the situation began to change dramatically. Christians, like the Jews, refused to worship the emperor as, living, as a living God, and they were working hard to make Christians of the entire population of the empire. <clears throat> the main cause of hatred of early Christians in Roman society came from the distinctive lifestyle. Tertullian states that they had the reputation of living aloof from the crowds. The New Testament word used to describe Christians in the term is the term hagios, often translated saints. It means holy ones, but the root suggests differently. Holy things are different from other things. The temple is holy because it is different from other buildings. The Sabbath day is holy because it is different from other days. The Christian, therefore, is a person who is fundamentally different. Men typically view people who are different with suspicion. Conformity is the way to a trouble-free life. So the more seriously Christians took their faith, the more they were in danger. 
Simply by living according to the teachings of Jesus, the Christian was a constant unspoken condemnation of the pagan way of life. These Christians did not go about criticizing, condemning, and disapproving, nor were they consciously self-righteous and superior. The Christian ethic itself was a criticism of pagan life. Christians' denial of other gods marked the followers of Jesus as enemies of the human race. Every pagan meal began with a liquid offering and a prayer to the pagan gods. A Christian could not share or participate in that. Most pagan feasts and social parties were held in a temple to some god after a sacrifice had been made and the invitation was usually to dine at the table of that god. Christians were considered rude and discourteous when they declined these invitations. Other social events, such as gladiatorial combats, were rejected by Christians because they felt they were inhuman. Christians' fear of idolatry led to difficulties in making a living because a mason might be involved in building the walls of a heathen temple, a tailor might be making robes for a pagan priest, an incense maker in making incense for pagan sacrifices. Tertullian even forbade Christians to be school teachers because such teaching involved using textbooks that told the ancient stories of the gods and called for observing the religious festivals of the pagan year. Everywhere the Christian turned, his life was on display because the gospel brought about revolutionary new attitude toward human life that could be seen in Christian views of slaves, children, and sex. Pagan society teetered on the brink of racial extinction through its excesses. Widespread hatred of Christians helps explain the first Roman persecution. In A.D. 64, during the reign of Emperor Nero, fire broke out in Rome and burned for six days and nights. The greater part of the city burned. Rumors circulated that Nero himself had caused the fire, arousing the people of Rome against the emperor. In response, Nero accused the Christians of having set the fire. The accusation was untrue, but many Christians were arrested and a terrible persecution followed. It was during this persecution that the apostles Peter and Paul suffered martyrdom in Rome. Peter, at his own request and saying that he was not worthy to be crucified in the same manner as his master, was crucified with his head facing down. Paul, being a Roman citizen, was beheaded. Outbursts of bloodshed were common during the first and second centuries. Christians were left in peace for long periods of time. However, it only took a miraculous informer, a popular uproar, or a governor determined to carry out the letter of the law to create a storm of fierce persecution. The fact remained that the Christian, as a Christian, was legally an outlaw. Tertullian wrote, Public hatred asked but one thing, not the investigation of the crimes charged, but simply the confession of the Christian name. A second related cause of persecution of early Christians were the slanders disseminated about them. There was suspicion that the Christian gatherings were sexual orgies and cover for every kind of crime. The public was barred from attending Christian services, and this apparent secrecy bred distrust. Christians were accused of a host of offenses, including sexual sins and cannibalism. This charge came from the fact that one Christian meeting was called the agape, the love feast, and from the custom of the holy kiss when greeting fellow believers. The change of cannibalism started because the Lord's Supper was practiced in secret, and Jesus had said at the Last Supper, This bread is my body, the cup is my blood. The pagans concluded that the Christians must be eating and drinking human flesh and blood. The mobs thought that the people who did such terrible things, if allowed to live, would bring all sorts of trouble on the land because such wickedness would stir up the gods who would come to punish them for allowing the Christians to exist. Pliny, a governor in Asia Minor, Minor wrote, wrote Emperor Trajan in A.D. 112 asking his advice about the best way to deal with these Christians. He wrote, I do not know just what to do with the Christians. For I have never been present at one of their trials. Is just being a Christian enough to punish, or must something bad actually have been done? What I have done, in the case of those who admitted they were Christians, was to order them sent to Rome, if citizens. If not, to have them killed. I was sure they deserved to be punished because they were so stubborn. In other words, they wouldn't, you know, recant their confession of Christ. Pliny felt Christians had to be guilty of something. He just wasn't sure what it was. Another cause of Christian suffering may seem strange. Christians were accused of atheism because Rome, Romans could not understand an imageless worship. Monotheism held no attraction for them, 
And as a result, they blame Christians for insulting the gods of the state. Tertullian wrote in his Apology, If the Tiber floods the city, or if the Nile refuses to rise, or if the sky withholds its rain, if there is an earthquake, a famine, a pestilence, at once the cries raised, Christians to the lion. They got blamed for everything, in other words. Um, so the supreme cause of Roman persecution of Christians arose from the tradition of emperor worship. The roots of this practice lie in the merits of Roman rule. When Rome took over a country, impartial Roman justice arrived and Roman administration set the people free from unpredictable and often bloodthirsty tyrants. The roads were cleared of robbers, the seas of pirates, and a new century entered life. Uh, this was Pax Romania, the Roman peace. The general result was a deep and heartfelt attitude toward the spirit of Rome. It was an easy step for the spirit of Rome to become the godless, the goddess Roma. And by the second century B.C., there were many temples in Asia Minor, Minor to the goddess Roma. But the human heart and mind needed a symbol, and the idea evolved into the goddess Roma and the spirit of Rome incarnated in the emperor. He embodied Rome. He was Rome. In him, the spirit of Rome resided and had its earthly dwelling. The problem of Roman Empire was unification. It stretched from the Euphrates to Ireland, from Germany to North Africa, from Spain, Spain to Egypt, and included all kinds of people and languages, faiths and traditions. How could the consciousness of the empire be brought into the lives of such diverse people? There is no unifying force like the force of a common religion, and Caesar worship lay ready at hand. Temples to the Godhead Emperor soon appeared in every providence of the empire. Little by little, the belief that any allegiance in conflict with loyalty to the emperor and therefore the empire could only lead to a disintegration of the order of the empire. Emperor uh, Decius in 40, 249 to 251 made Caesar worship universal and compulsory for every race and nation within the empire and the single exception of the Jews with the single exception of the Jews on a certain day of the year every Roman citizen had to go to the temple of Caesar and burn a pinch of incense saying Caesar is Lord when he had done that he was given a certificate to guarantee that he had done so. After performing this act, he could go away and worship any god he wished, so long as the worship did not affect public decency and order. Caesar worship was primarily a test of political loyalty, a test of whether or not a man was a good citizen, which presented a great problem for Christians. 